So, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, Chartered Accountant Ashish Dua, an ex KPMG director, and now in my role of account manager with the leading US and Canada immigration law firm Green and Spiegel webinar on the opportunities in the US and Canada. So we have named the webinar as US and Canada, the gateway to the global business. And today the special focus is going to be on the automobile sector, a very important sector. I hope everybody is able to hear my voice. Uh, in this webinar today, I like to welcome special invitee, Mr. Sohinder Gill, the Chief Executive Officer for Hero Electric, a person, a company, big time into the electric vehicle, which is a very important subject. And we will have shortly have some few questions to be discussed with Mr. Sohinder Singh Gill. I am joined in this webinar by senior leadership of Green and Spiegel. I would like to welcome managing partner, Mr. Stephen Green, senior corporate lawyer partner and specializing in hugely into the work uh, related visas, uh, Madam Christina, and a very young and dynamic senior lawyer, Mr. Benjamin Green, to this conference. So welcome to you all. And again, it's going to be a very lovely and knowledgeable session. I would like to take this opportunity to also thank the marketing and communication team of Green and Spiegel, who have very intelligently put together the agenda and the scope for this webinar. So thanks to Esther and Eve for doing an excellent job. Without wasting too much of time, and as the agenda is dis being displayed right now, we would have excellent sessions by Mr. Stephen Green, Christina, and Benjamin. And towards, we'll have the open Q&A session also. But to start with, let me open the session with an interactive discussion with respected Mr. Sohinder Singh Gill, the CEO for Hero Electric Vehicles. Mr. Sohinder Singh Gill, if you can hear my voice and can enable your camera, that would be an honor, sir. Yes, Ashish, I'm very much able to hear you and my camera is on. Can you look at? I, let me, sir, try finding you out because uh, it's always a pleasure and honor to see you and also work with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I can see my own pic here. <laughs> your camera is beautiful. No problem. Oh, Great, thank you so much. Okay, so Mr. Gill, as always, it's a pleasure and honor to learn from you. So I will take liberties of asking some few questions. And uh, though I'm a chartered accountant, but still consider myself as a layman in the industry you lead. So Mr. Gill, you know, in the recent times, with all these changes happening in the automobile sector, where we hear about terms like electric vehicle, hydrogen fuel cell, hybrid. So I would love to know, and I'm sure the participants would love to know, what is the long-term future? You know, where does the things will finally settle down? So over to you, Mr. Gill, on this question. Thank you, Ashish. And, uh... Thank you, audience and my peers. Well, I would begin with saying that it is just beginning of the change. And uh, so many things are going to unfold in near future. It's just the start. And in that beginning, we are also already seeing a lot of disruption. On one side, there are the big wigs of automotive giants who are still not in sync with changing to this new age technology for valid reasons because they have they are capital intensive they have mm -hmm. huge you know competitiveness and that's why there's a drag that they're trying to have that inertia of not changing on the other side the new age guys are giving a real challenge to these people that if you don't come into the canvas we will paint the, our own picture 
this Understood. is going on and from here on we believe that you know you can't hold on these things forever because this okay. is green this is sustainable this makes sense mm -hmm. for the customer whether mm -hmm. it is electric or whether it is any other fuel which is less polluting so it mm -hmm. really makes a lot of sense for the customer so while it is a slow start it is a slow burn but in mm -hmm. times to come you will see a sudden you know acceleration all over the world it's happening in bits and pieces it will be comprehensive mm -hmm. it will be everywhere and there will be no looking back on that and once that happens the big wigs also will fall into line and make it bigger and bigger the snowballing effect will start so i believe in 4 to 5 years from now we will cross the threshold so called threshold of adoption in a big way of this new age technology which is good for us good for environment and good for the customer beautiful that's very good to hear now the related question i have mr gill that you know practically i would say in my living time since i was born you know and i am now 56 year old but do look look young right now so i have seen you know huge stakeholders involved in the automobile sector whether it is the spare part dealers whether it is the gas station the oem manufacturers you know or the main vehicle manufacturers and for years and years and decades they have been producing one technology you know product as we call it you know now with this landslide change in the automobile sector and automobile sector you know one of the huge employers globally and in india and canada and i'm sure in other places too so are people or the infrastructure ready for this change now well yes and no and somewhere it is reactive somewhere it is proactive country to country like mm -hmm. you've seen especially in india things are sort of more reactive when it comes to things which are involving larger expenses larger capex like infrastructure so it is a lagging factor whereas in case of us canada we have seen charging infrastructure is a leading factor over there is proactively happening it is being planned but mind you this change is going to affect everybody including even a guy who is sort of driving a car like you are saying you are you are in your 50s i am two generations older than you so see when i used to drive a motorcycle i would would having i would be having a thrill of shifting to second gear and making a lot of noise i lost it yeah. when it auto automatic cars cars came maybe yeah. in 4 to 5 years time you will lose the charm of you know swirling your steering wheel and singing you just sit down like a amazon box being delivered to one from destination to another so it will be like mm -hmm. a driverless car may be coming in there so right from a consumer to all the stakeholders it's going to touch lives of everybody when countries like india for example skill is most mm -hmm. important the roadside mechanics who are right now doing petrol vehicles they may lose jobs they may lose their livelihood but they will have to fend for themselves even if there is a skill india program there is not much happening there but people here know mm -hmm. how to fend for their lives for their livelihoods so yeah. it's now question of where the government meets midway with the industry to make mm -hmm. it in a systematic streamlined manner i believe in many countries it is happening i've seen it happening in canada also where there are steps being taken on both sides i believe in india also when things go better there will be a halfway meeting ground between what government should do and what the industry should do what other stakeholders should do because after 10 years there is nothing like getting new businesses into uh, petrol vehicles or dirty fuel vehicles it's all going to be hydrogen or electric or any other fuel solid state or whatever so it's a one way traffic here on or it perfect now this brings to another question sir as you mentioned about different government being ready at different levels you know so when i look at the global scenario and sometime i do get confused that we hear about tesla being a landmark in the electric vehicle they coming to india for example on the other side the indian car producers themselves saying that they are producing the electric vehicle so if the indian are producing electric vehicle then why do they need tesla this is just a, you know so what is the difference in the different country technology and innovation so far see india is cost conscious india is a affordable vehicle market more than 70% 80% of the cars 
or two wheelers they are into the range of very much affordable vehicles mm -hmm. whereas the north america canada us they already have tasted success in premium bikes or premium cars or premium vehicles including electric mm -hmm. trucks so these mm -hmm. are two different markets altogether in india indian market is tuned or indian businesses are tuned to produce affordable value for money vehicles but all sure. consumers in india are not going to go for value for money they want lifestyle they want premiumness sure. they want the best in class so to sure. cater to even if it is a small percentage even if it is 5% 3% of the population teslas are a must like today you have all the best cars in the world in india and they are selling yeah. so yeah. therefore both have to exist in all the categories premiumness as well as affordability perfectly agree but i believe uh, dr gail mr gail that in the long run you know the best and sustainable would be commonly across the borders you know so from that perspective like how does the two countries or different country like us and canada or india or their government should synergize each of the country strength to make the best for the consumers and for the capitalists for example sorry i have to use the word capitalist because at the end of the day they are the one owning the companies you know so sure. see uh, india and north america particularly canada they are poles apart right in terms of many many things for example india is volume oriented low cost uh, businesses mm -hmm. canada us is research and development lot of money behind that innovations mm -hmm. niche products so these mm -hmm. are two different entities as countries but imagine when both of them get together it makes a complete story beautiful Otherwise, yeah they both are incomplete in their own respect i have seen canadian Uh, businesses in electric doing so well in r&d in innovations mm -hmm. in ips even small scale players are doing wonderful job but they are not able to scale mm -hmm. up for scaling Understood. up they have to have a market for that they have to come to india or depend on china now there are other two factors playing here you know china whatever you say people are factoring china as a stand by india as a stand by to china in future at least so there's a change mm -hmm. point there even if china is still a good source they believe that any day due to political changes or otherwise they will have to go to countries like india so that is another thing for north america and canada that they have already started factoring india as a standby base for businesses in which they were investing in china so that's a golden opportunity for india also it's only Beautiful. unfortunate that in canada and india there is some relationships which is spiraling down for some time but it's only few months here and there i believe the businesses will go in a different way than the politics goes the businesses Lovely. have their own definition so i i would say that if we want to really enter into a new age of, of a technology mobility solution it's ideal for indian businesses and canadian businesses to understand each other to Lovely. get to yeah. know their gaps the white spaces and there are a lot of white spaces there a lot of niches there where if yeah. both of them come to come together i think we can take the world by storm beautiful so i think that would also mean that there could be encouragement for indian businessman especially the msme sector you know that the msme sector is hugely involved in the component manufacturing and other aspect should also deeply study the canadian and the us market and look at the way to further collaborate on those issues for a global uh, you know growth of their business and for definitely for doing best in the area we are talking about mr kill i hope you will agree with that you know i'm oh, just going uh, yeah. like i'm heading the association of electric vehicles also there are a lot of msbs there i keep yeah. telling them you are going to hit a glass ceiling if you don't move now because for yeah. you the universe is there but if you work like medium scale or a small scale don't open up yourself then you will be hitting a blockade and for you it is so easy because you are learning the tricks of trade by back of your head but you are not opening up yourself to the advent of new technologies proactively you are waiting it to happen so don't do that just Beautiful. at this point of time even if you have limited resources 
cut your organization to two parts one part should engage into new age mobility with global sense and even if it is a small let it grow independent of it so don't hold Lovely. everything to your chest let Lovely. the organization Lovely. be divided into two let us do those things which are innovative little ahead of time 3 years later and work on them and be ready for that from component level or technology level to showcase to the world in north america here me and you can do it together much better perfect thank you mr gill and again i am sure this is not the only session i am going to learn from you there will be future interactions and again you will always find me following you very closely so you like it or not but that's the way i will be doing my dear mr gill okay so thank you a lot for the <laughs> lovely informative session and now i like to welcome mr stephen green uh, to take up the update and i think that's very intelligently moved to the space of canada being one of the very big contributors on the automobile side so over to you mr stephen green welcome to you for this discussion good afternoon ashish and uh, thank you so much uh, so hinder with respect to your insight into the industry uh, as you've indicated the electric vehicle and battery plants are very very important to the canadian economy and to the government and before you now is a slide demonstrating how much the canadian government has invested in the various industries of electric vehicles and and batteries look at the numbers you're seeing you know 15 billion dollars in a place in ontario another billion dollars in another place in montreal so you'll see how important this industry is to us and you know there's so many components to producing an uh, electric vehicle battery plant and it's a wonderful opportunities for smes to get involved in and provide their special innovative products to these particular battery plants uh and really become part of the ontario ecosystem the quebec ecosystem and quite candidly all throughout canada with respect to batteries and electric vehicles so christine and i are going to talk about mobility today meaning you know how do i get my company to canada if i'm interested in in investing getting involved in this type of industry and we're going to really divide it into two areas we have temporary programs which mean that i want to come to canada for a certain period of time i want to get involved in my business in canada for a certain period of time and then leave and then there's a whole other group of individuals that want to come to canada and remain here and eventually acquire their canadian citizenship so let's begin with the short sort of temporary stays generally in canada when you want to enter the labor market you require a work permit a document permitting you to work inside of canada but many industries approach the canadian government and said you know what there's a lot of work involved in getting a work permit to come to canada and sometimes individuals only come here for a very short period of time so the canadian government looked at that and they agreed with industries inside of canada and they provided this special exemption for people that want to come here for a very short period of time they are in a very sort of highly skilled occupation and the government says come and we're going to permit you to actually work as a visitor and enter the labor force inside of canada and the way it works is that if there is a very short project so for example if i'm involved in the automotive industry and i've been able to you know get involved in a canadian business and i have to provide my 
products to that business, or you know, maybe I'm even involved in somehow uh, setting up the the production line, and I want to send some people over for a short period of time. I'm permitted to send those people to Canada for up to 15 days where they can enter the labor force without getting a work permit. Then they must leave because they can't work longer than 15 days. And they're actually allowed to come back if a six month window has happened where they've been outside of Canada and then they can work for another 15 days. But they even said that, wait a minute, if the project is going to take you a little longer than 15 days. They will let you come and work in Canada for up to 30 days once a year. So it's a great opportunity where you don't have to go through the difficult process of obtaining a, a work permit. Uh, it facilitates both the foreign company of bringing people in and it also helps the Canadian company because they don't have to go through such a difficult process with respect to getting a work permit. So it's a wonderful opportunity for people to come and participate in our labor force, receive income from Canadian sources under this business visitor um, for a short duration. But if you do require a work permit, we have various programs. And the first one Christine is going to talk about is the intercompany transfer. Thank you, Stephen. So as Stephen mentioned previously, um, the intercompany transferee, this is the, the work permit category that most SMEs use to um, open up an operation in Canada. It's the most facilitative and Ashish and I work very closely together in getting um, SMEs into Canada. Um, so the way the program works is essentially you can expand your Indian um, entity into Canada and you can transfer your employees from India into Canada, provided that they've been working for the Indian entity for at least one year in an executive, senior manager or specialized knowledge position. So executive and senior manager positions are, are pretty self-explanatory. Um, with respect to specialized knowledge workers, what the government is really looking for is people who have proprietary knowledge of your particular business. Um, and they're specialized within your company as well within the industry. So the idea is because of their specialization, they are essential to the expansion of the, um, of the company in Canada. So this one requires a bit more information, but it's something that we can definitely um, you know, put together in terms of, of understanding the particular lines of business. Now, um, when a company is new, meaning it has been in operation in Canada for less than one year, it's considered a startup company. So with that, the Canadian government wants additional information about what this new business is. So these innovative um, SME businesses and the different um, um, industries that want to expand into Canada, you have to prove that um, you establish this entity in Canada, so incorporate it. You can either do it federally or provincially, depending on, on how you decide to establish your company business in Canada. You have to create a business plan. So this is where a lot of the work comes in, in terms of explaining to the Canadian government, okay, I've done my research. These are the reasons I want to expand into Canada. This is a, you know, this is an innovative idea. There's a gap in the market. Um, we want to expand because we've seen great results in India and we know you know, similar things would be happening in Canada. And the what we really have to expand on in these business plans is that you're creating jobs, job opportunities for Canadians and permanent residents. So as a result of this expansion and the transfer of these senior executives or specialized knowledge workers, we're already, we are also creating business um, opportunities and jobs for Canadians and permanent residents. And usually we provide a two to five year window in terms of what that operation is going to look like and the jobs that are being created. And the other thing to be mindful of is establishing financial support. So in Canada, when we are doing these types of transfers, they want to know that the Indian operation is functional and has, you know, is, is making um, enough funds and that there's enough funds that can be transferred to the Canadian operation initially um, once they're starting out that operation. So Establishing all of this um, in a new company um, requires a bit more work on the front end, but once we get the initial work permit, which is valid for one year, 
We then can extend the work permit um, up to seven years for executives and senior managers and five years for specialized knowledge workers. So it really allows businesses the opportunity and the time to expand in Canada. So there's the understanding that within the first year, you know, the, the objectives in the business plan may not have been achieved, but it allows them to work on those um, over the, the, that period of time, and especially as the extensions come through. You know, Christina, you, you talk about the established financial support of the new operation in Canada. And a lot of times, you know, there's there's advantages for doing work outside of Canada because of the salary ranges, because in Canada, our salaries, you know, are quite high for skilled workers. Can you comment a little bit about if you are transferring someone for example, from India to Canada, a little bit about the salary. Like, can they earn the same salary they're earning in India if they come to Canada, especially with specialized knowledge, that type of stuff? Yeah, so in Canada, the Canadian government has established something that they call prevailing wage. So depending on the position and where in Canada the individual will be working, they do have to earn a particular salary. So specifically with respect to specialized knowledge workers, they must meet that, that requirement from the government. So um, when we're talking about specialized knowledge, that floor or the, the, the prevailing wage must be met. But if you're transferring someone that has additional um, you know, years of experience or you've established that you know, they're, they're 15 years with the company and they're a star employee and they're the only ones that know this particular methodology or tool, then that prevailing wage would have to be commensurate to their years of experience. So that's an absolute requirement with these types of applications. So that's why it's important to establish the financial ability of the Indian company and also to demonstrate that the Canadian operation will have enough funds in Canada to support the salary for the first year for that individual. So usually there's no perfect number, but it's to understand they can cover their salary plus the, the startup costs for that particular business. Right. So the Canadian government doesn't look at, you know, a low salary too favorable. You can't be in a position to, you know, bring in individuals because the labor costs are less on those people. So they have to meet whatever the proper wage level is inside of Canada. That's cool. And then as we go on to Stephen, you'll talk about the LMA. Is that requirement for all these as well? Right. So let's talk about LMIAs. There's a lot of information out there about LMIAs and what it really means is the following. The Canadian government has stated that before a person can come and work in Canada, they generally have to test the labor market unless they fall into special categories like the intercompany transfer, which uh, Christina talked about. And by testing the Canadian labor market, what they mean is that employers have to go out into Canada and they have to attempt to recruit a Canadian or a permanent resident to try to fill that job that they're looking for. And only once they've attempted to recruit within the Canadian market, are they then able to offer a job to someone that's not a permanent resident or a Canadian citizen? And that's the regular stream. And generally that process for foreign nationals that are living in India from starting to test the Canadian labor market until the actual issuance of a work permit can be anywhere between four to six months. And it's important to also understand that if you are going through this process of attempting to get a work permit with an LMIA, it's a two-step process because two departments are involved in the processing of this particular type of work permit. One department make sure that the employer has tested the Canadian labor market. And once they are satisfied, they actually issue the LMIA to the company that then permits the foreign national to take that 
LMIA certificate and then apply for the work permit. But remember that just because a foreign national living abroad gets an LMIA, it doesn't automatically mean they're going to have be eligible for that work permit. They have to satisfy the work permit criteria, meaning will they leave after the work permit is going to expire? Can they do the actual job that they are required to do based on that LMIA? So it's important to understand that with respect to the regular stream of LMIAs. But there's also a very special stream of LMIAs, and it's called the Global Talent Stream. And what happened about 15 years ago, the Canadian government received a lot of pressure from businesses saying everybody, for example, in a certain industry knows that there aren't enough workers like this inside of Canada. And we really don't need to test the Canadian labor market. And immigration looked at it. Uh, the other department were responsible for seeing whether you know, Canadians can fill certain jobs also looked at it. And they came to a conclusion that yes, there are certain occupations in Canada that we know there is a shortage of Canadians and permanent residents. And if you look at the next slide with respect to the list, you'll see that a majority of them are involved in the sort of computer area, where if you are an employer in Canada and you need certain types of engineers, you need certain types of technicians, then you don't have to test the Canadian labor market, but you enter into an agreement with the Canadian government where you go ahead and say, okay, if you let us bring in this temporary foreign worker, we promise to help the Canadian labor market with training, uh, that type of thing. So it's a public-private type of agreement. And again, you have to fall within those types of um, occupations that are listed here. And if you do apply under this particular program or any program for a work permit or even immigration, it permits you to bring with family members. And what do I mean by family members? Canada permits you to bring along your family if you are legally married to your spouse, if you're in a common law relationship with your spouse, and all of your dependent children under the age of 22. So again, if you get a work permit, you can bring your spouse with you, you can bring your children with you that are under 22. And some of the universities even permit children that are under the age of 22 to pay local university fees if they decide they want to go to school. So that's a very important uh, you know, point that you get to bring your family to Canada. Now, those individuals that want to stay here on a permanent basis can apply for permanent residence. The permanent resident process generally is called express entry, where you go ahead and you establish your background to the Canadian government, you tell them about your age, your education, have you worked in Canada? Do you have close family in Canada? Have you ever studied in Canada? What's your English ability? What's your French ability? And the Canadian government looks into this pool of candidates and every couple weeks, they invite a certain number of individuals to apply for permanent residence under this particular program of express entry. And, you know, there are skilled workers that use this particular program to get immigration to Canada. And the last sort of permanent resident program that I want to talk about is called the Startup Visa Program. And what that is, is Canada is trying to encourage innovative startups to come to Canada. And they hope that these startups will create Canadian jobs, 
They hope that these startups will become global and bring even more business into Canada. And what we have with these particular types of immigration programs is that the government has asked the assistance of various organizations that are in the startup world. And what you have to do is present your idea to either a venture capital group, an angel group, or a business incubator group. And if one of those three organizations likes your idea and believes that it is innovative, then they will issue you a letter of support, which would permit you to begin the immigration process, which would permit you to get a work permit for you and your dependent family members to come to Canada and start up this innovative business. You have to speak English at a basic level of five. And it's important to also understand that the Canadian government a couple of days ago announced a major change to this program where they have indicated that these three organizations that will give you a letter of support are only permitted to do 10 applications a year. So certain angel investor groups, and there's quite a lot of them, if you approach them, they will say, you know, we want to look at your startup because they're only allowed to do 10 per year. So there's been a big shift and we're going to have to see how it will affect the processing of um, applications for permanent residents. So from a Canadian perspective, that's really what you know, we're going to talk about today. We'll certainly answer your questions um, at the end of this part. And now I guess we're going to pass it over to Benjamin to talk about U.S. options and expanding into the U.S. market. Benjamin, you're on mute, I believe. Benjamin. Still on mute, Benjamin. <laughs> Any better? Yes, you're on now. Now you're good. Now it's working. Thanks, everyone. So thank you, Stephen, and good afternoon, everyone. When talking about the United States and thinking about the United States, it is very difficult, unlike Canada, to go straight there and start doing business. There's, there's that old John F. Kennedy quote, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Many, many work visas into the United States require that, require a commitment made to the United States and require a presence in the United States. The two most popular work visas in the United States are the L1 or the American equivalent of the intracompany transfer that Christina mentioned, or the H1B, which is done via a lottery. These are very popular visas, and as a result, they're quite difficult to get. The H1B, for example, sees more, almost 1 million people entered into this lottery every single year. And the odds of selection are quite low. Odds of selection are less than 15% on average year over year, which for business people like yourselves is obviously not a predictable outcome. The L1 or the intercompany transferee is a little more stable, provides a little more predictability. But again, you cannot do this without a U.S. entity and a physical U.S. presence. There's a required sort of initial cost and an initial startup structure that must be there in order to start transferring yourselves, transferring your families and transferring employees into the United States. Uh, there are certain visas available to Canadians. There are special programs and special permissions for Canadians that unfortunately are not available for Indian persons. 
And then these are only short term visas. Unlike the startup program that Stephen mentioned, you cannot transition so easily towards permanent residence. These are temporary work permits that other programs are necessary to transition. But even before these work permits, the ability to travel to the United States and the ability to enter the United States on an entirely short term basis is done by their basic visitor visa, a B1 slash two visa. I assume several of you attending today have this visa already. This allows you to enter the United States for tourism or for short term business. When I say short term business, I mean the ability to go for meetings, to go for planning, to consider investment, to look at different markets, like I mentioned about potentially opening up these US entities, potentially starting up your business in the United States. You can enter and consider these on a US visitor visa. However, First of all, they take a very long time to get if you do not have one already. Uh, we looked and in India right now, it's pacing at almost half of a year from the day you make the appointment to the day you're actually seen. And on top of that, your activities are quite limited. You're limited in time. You can only be in the United States for a short period of time. And on top of that, you cannot do many things that business people like to do. You cannot open a bank account. You cannot really start buying up companies and buying up properties to support yourself on this sort of a visa. You need to be very careful on top of that because of these limitations that you do not cause problems for yourself later on. One of the most common issues we see is someone entering the United States in this status and not wanting to leave. And as a result, they can cause problems for themselves, their families, their companies, if they don't play by the rules. So back again to that L1, I think the most high potential sort of visa for this group, you are able to use this L1 visa to create your business, to do this new office L1, to be employee number one in the United States. However, as I mentioned, there is a decent amount of capital commitment you need to make. The United States government wants to see that you are there to contribute to the United States, to grow in the United States, not just to bring yourself and your family over and enjoy living in the United States. The most important part here in securing this work permit is the business plan. They wanna see what is going on. What is your intention in the United States? Do you intend to employ Americans? Do you intend to create a factory, grow your business? And careful planning on how you want to structure this business will affect your visa outcome very much. We work with employees and companies every day on this sort of a visa, but because there isn't an established plan, if you are the first employee or the business has not been open or active in the United States, it's very important, again, to think about that business plan. What are your short-term goals? What are your long-term goals in the United States? And how will your presence there contribute to the country and allow your business to grow? Now, finally, green cards. Um, as I've mentioned previously, everything I've talked about before is a short-term either visitor or work visa. A green card or U.S. permanent residence is indefinite. It, ex it allows you to stay, live, and work indefinitely. There are two categories with which you can apply for a green card, economic and family. Family class, meaning you are related in some way to a U.S. green card or U.S. citizen. That can be through marriage, but it must be a member of your immediate family. It cannot be your uncle, it cannot be a cousin. But those take a very long time to do. All green cards take a very long time to do. The reason is, is because there's a line. Over the United States only issues so many green cards per country per year. Many persons from India have been interested in the United States and applied for green cards to the United States. 
And as a result, you will hear that the United States categories for green cards for Indians are backlogged. This has been the case for many years. However, the United States, understanding that so many business people from India are waiting for these green cards, have different programs to either support fast tracking an application for a green card through different categories or through allowing you to quote unquote freeze and wait and get a work permit pending the green card coming. As Stephen mentioned for Canada, these green cards can flow to you and your family as well. However, I would note that all your children must be under the age of 21 when reaching an application point. Otherwise, they cannot come with you. Now, most of these green card categories require some local employer participation. A very popular way to get a green card for Indian business people is through the EB-5 category, which means you do not need a US employer, you jump straight to green card. It is a very expensive program, but the benefits are very lucrative in that you go directly to a green card, directly to US permanent residence. All of those limitations and requirements for starting up of a business and investing in the local US economy and supporting American jobs are not required on an EB-5 green card. The main factor here is the cost. You cannot expect to get a green card. It is not legal to get an EB-5 green card without investing at least $800,000 US into the US economy. There are obviously specific legalities around that investment, but the most popular version here is that 800,000 figure through what's known as a regional center, where the United States certifies certain programs to accept this investment, and in the eyes of the US government, it really creates a win-win. A win for the individual immigrant investor who gets themselves and their families green cards, that immediate US permanent residence, and for the US economy, right, where they fund development, they fund projects in special interest areas. I would note again, that although you jump directly to a green card and don't require a work visa, EB-5 green cards take a very long time as well. I don't think you can expect to have a green card in your hand for two, three, four, five plus years, just because again, so many immigrant investors from India have applied that there is a long time to wait. And that said, I think, I believe that's it for our sort of quick trip around American immigration. I, Stephen, Christina, would be thrilled to take any questions you have at this time. And those questions could be both for the US and Canada immigration as Green and Spiegel as a law firm has offices in both the countries. Anybody has any questions, please. Or you could leave your questions in the chat box where we can pick up the questions. Let me check the chat box. If somebody is typing or is oh, one one of the questions that I saw was uh, you know, when you apply for immigration to Canada, be it either a work permit or immigration, what happens if you had a refusal under any category before you apply under the new work permit you're looking for or perhaps immigration? It's very important that everyone understand that if you've ever had a refusal of a visa from any country in the world, not just Canada, you must advise the Canadian authorities of that refusal. So you, for example, may have applied for a U.S. visa, that visa got refused, then you want to come to Canada on a work permit, you must, you must disclose to the Canadian government that you were refused a U.S. visa. And if you don't, you can be found to have not told the truth and therefore prohibited from coming to Canada for up to five years. So there's a five-year ban if you're not truthful on your application. Also, it's important to understand that if you are interested in applying for immigration to Canada 
that we have free medicine in Canada. And therefore, everyone that wants to come to Canada must establish to the immigration authorities that they're healthy and there's no family issues that are related in a medical way. So that's important to also understand. And also lastly would be criminality. If there are any forms of criminal convictions anywhere in the world, you must disclose that to the Canadian authorities. And sometimes it's not an issue because a certain period of time has passed. Sometimes it is a very serious issue and you may be prohibited from applying for a work permit or immigration because of some criminal difficulties that you've had um, in the past. Very nice. Um, one of the comments I just wanted to make, just to put things into perspective in terms of Canada and the US, as Benjamin went through some of the challenges that people face with um, US immigration, what happens is a lot of companies that are looking to break into the North American market, they will come into Canada, establish their business. And then once you're in Canada, being able to do business in the US and eventually in the future, expanding into the US is a nice, um, you know, something to keep in mind in terms of planning long term. Canada is usually the foothold and then that's the way to expand into the US market. So, um, and as Legiman said, once you become a permanent resident or even a Canadian citizen, um, there's additional ways to get that work authorization um, down in the United States. So that's just something to keep in mind. Our um, immigration policies kind of complement each other in that respect. And it's interesting, um, when you apply for immigration to Canada, you apply as a family. So if there's a husband, wife, and three children, you apply with the main applicant either being the mom or the dad. Everyone comes together as the family. But once you arrive in Canada, everyone is considered separately moving forward. So in some circumstances, you may have a situation where one of the parents say, you know what, I'm not really, you know, wanting to spend so much time in Canada. I think I may go back to my home country. It does not affect the other members of the family and they can proceed with citizenship and they get to keep their immigration as well. So it's important to understand that. Um, and also something really interesting. I mean, Christina talked about, you know, you come to Canada, you may orig originally come on a work permit and then convert that to immigration and then eventually become a Canadian citizen. Unlike the United States, um, Canada only taxes you as a Canadian citizen if you are a resident of Canada. And we find a lot of our clients look at tax planning and they say to themselves, well, you know what, I'm going to come to Canada as a permanent resident. I arrive as a permanent resident. I, I meet the citizenship requirements, that being I've physically resided in Canada for three out of five years. I apply for citizenship. I, of course, pay my taxes as I'm required to do by law. But then once I become a Canadian citizen, if I choose, I can leave Canada, become a non-resident for tax purposes, and keep my Canadian citizenship forever. Unlike the United States, where you always have to help the U.S. economy when you're a U.S. citizen or green card holder. Excellent, yeah. Just one question from my side also, Stephen and Christina. Any businessman, when he is thinking of immigrating or settling down in a new country, would first like to test the waters. So from that perspective, are there any, as we call it, exploratory exploration visas for such businessmen? They can just come in for some time, meet the counterparts in the in Canadian geography or in the US geography and get a comfort feeling before they go uh, commit themselves more into long-term visas? Christina or Stephen, any answer yes, to that? Yes, I mean, question? yes, they can come in. Um, Stephen discussed that a bit at the beginning of the presentation with respect to business visitors. So Indian nationals can travel to Canada on a temporary resident visa they would come in as tourists slash business visitors just to do exploratory visits. 
to understand more about the market, more about what's available. There's a question here. Uh, uh, hi, Alex. The question is said that I am Italian and working in India for a joint venture company between an Italian and an Indian company. We are planning to search for distributors in US and Canada in phase one and later on to set up a small assembly unit of our product, which is a golf cart. Can I freely visit USA and Canada on a basis of common business visa and for how long? Well, as, a, as, as you know, Christina just mentioned, if you're coming here for business purposes to explore, look, uh, you know, at distributors, absolutely, you can come as a business visitor. But if you are going to enter the actual labor market, then, of course, you would need a work permit. Now, we have certain agreements with countries that makes the issuance of a work permit simpler. Italy does fall into some of these agreements. We have a special agreement where if you're under the age of either 30 or 35, you can get a special work permit here, open work permit to do what you want if you meet certain criteria. We also have a special agreement between various European countries. Uh, and if you fall into that area too, you can get a work permit. So if you're gonna enter the labor market for Canada, uh, you definitely would need a work permit, but you may be able to take advantage of some of these free trade agreements as an Italian national. And I'll certainly let Benjamin comment on the U.S. Sure. On the on the American side of things. As as an Italian national, I assume you would have ESTA, sort of their visa waiver, and that allows you to enter for 90 days at a time. So I, I think that's sort of the most direct answer here, which is you can enter the United States as a business visitor for 90 days at a time. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, again, you cannot enter the local labor market, but if your activities are confined to training and meetings and looking for distributors and meeting with potential distributors, that would, at that level of understanding, be okay under ESTA. Perfecto. So I think, uh, Stephen, uh, Christina and Benjamin, thanks a lot uh, for all the valuable inputs. Um, we would, I am sure this uh, recorded session will be shared to many more people, and especially uh, the initial one on the automobile and the story on the batteries of the Canada will be a good takeaways for a lot of people involved in the automobile sector. And anyway, excellent uh, overview of the immigrations for both US and Canada. Uh, I think with that note, I would like to thank each one of you for making this uh, webinar quite knowledgeable. The recorded session will be shared with a lot of people. And Mr. Stephen, uh, on a personal note, looking forward to meet you personally when you arrive here. And uh, again, in-person sessions also being planned. So whoever could not join or will like to join the in-person sessions, there are some big events being planned in Delhi and Bombay. With that note, thanks to you and everybody for the excellent session. With that Thank note, you. Esther and Eve, I would love to formally ask you to close this session now. Well in time.